And welcome to another Deep Adaptation Q&A with me, Jem Bendel, and our guest this month, Skeena Rathor. Now, Skeena, I met a couple of years ago. Uh, she is a founding member of the uh, climate and ecological campaign organization, Extinction Rebellion, uh, within which she's a founder of their guardianship and visioning circle. Uh, and has played a key role at the heart of Extinction Rebellion uh, since it started, since it was uh, being formed, and even before, uh, through her personal connections and work previously with uh, the, fact the people involved in Rising Up. So, Skeena, thank you very much for, for joining a Deep Adaptation Q&A. Thank you for inviting me, Jen. So, it's, um, I think what would be really, really good, uh, just for people who don't know too much about Extinction Rebellion, believe it or not, there might be some, mm -hmm. um, but also yourself and, uh, and what really kind of motivates people to not just participate loosely, but actually participate fully, full time at the heart of things like you've done now for two years. What motivates you? So could you say something about how you got involved mm -hmm. in Extinction Rebellion? What motivated you? What were the, the key moments perhaps? Yes, I can say lots, <laughs> um, and I'll try, try not to say lots. Um, you called us, at, by the way, you, you said we were a campaign, but we're a movement. Um, a movement, okay. Is how I just would like to, to, to emphasize there's a movement in the greatest scheme of things, right? In, in, in terms of we're moving into and with something quite spectacular, I think. Um, how did I come about? And well, I think you know what happened, Gem, and I'll, I'll, but we want to share it is that, um, so my life was, was dedicated to really to social justice issues as well as um, my professional work as a body, mind, heart teacher. And I arrived at your doorstep in Cumbria with an idea about writing, rewriting a leadership um syllabus for the Labour Party for women in leadership in the Labour Party and um the title of your three-day event was the poetics of leadership so there I was ready to learn more about the poetics the stories of leadership and um you dropped a bomb right well that's how it felt for me and um, instead, what happened for me was this huge emotional, physical experience, um, intellectual experience as well, in understanding where the climate science was in its reality and what that meant for my work um, as a campaigner, as a because um, I, ha I, I, ha I was involved with Rising Up and Compassionate Stroud, the grandmothership, as a rebel maybe, or as an activist. Um, it changed everything, changed everything. Um, I, I've described it to people like the day after I woke up, after having my first child, and um, you wake up that, that first morning as a new mother, and you know nothing is ever the, going to be the same again, that you're in a completely new dawn, and that's how it felt, listening to, to what you shared. And um, my friends, Simon Bramwell and Gail Bradbrook, I knew were right at the edge of this. And I knew I had been avoiding conversation with them because I had literally been cancelling um, meeting them. And so then I came straight home to Stroud and there I was in Gail's living room saying, what do we do? <laughs> and she said, well, we know what to do. And, and, and we, we went forward from there. We went forward from there. Yeah. Yeah. So the emotions, if you take yourself back two years, the emotions were, were what that, what, when you were sitting there with Gail shock, in the shock, horror, um, I actually felt, you know, my belief system is starting to crumble and collapse. Um, despair for, and, you know, for, I, the despair didn't last 
weeks at that point. I, I fall into it now sometimes again. It's with their waves of despair. Um, but it was shock. I was in deep shock. I was shaking for days. And I, as a, as a trauma therapist, I knew what that meant. I knew what to do with it. And, um, and that's, I sat with it and, and transformed it. And, and, and I'm still transforming it. We all are. I know we are. Yeah. So you had the, the benefit of knowing people who are close to you, who have a history yeah. in environmental activism and political that, activism. Yeah, such a privileged place, you know, and there are people in Stroud, the green, the green movement in Stroud is, is so, spe so huge, enormous, um, very strong. Um, I had been involved in transitions. I was a Green Party member before I became a Labour Party member. And, and it, so it was very easy for me to access um, empathy for, for what I was experiencing and what I was learning. Um, so a huge place of privilege. So did Gail and Simon try and calm you down with stories of we can fix this and what, what was the Most certainly response? not. Um, most certainly not. Gail, um, <laughs> Gail was overjoyed. Maybe that's the wrong word. At your shock. The, At your well, shock. In, in one sense she was, right? right because yeah. she felt people weren't listening. And uh, partly that Stroud had shut down to some of what she and Simon were saying. And she had been praying for you know, connection, bridging, all of those things. And she, she felt that something had shifted with, with me turning up at her door is how she describes it. Yeah, wow. So from all that experience, you bring that into your own personal experience, that emotional journey, and the way you want to support it with you know, sort of there, there. Um, you bring it into your work over the last years how have you taken that experience forward so that that both your own emotional journey how you processed it but also how you were held in that by Gail and Simon and others how have you taken that into what you do in in Extinction Rebellion because there have been must have been so many times of really painful conversations within the movie really great question and I feel it's a great question because actually it is about taking ourselves, isn't it, into, into truth and our pain and our grief and our sense of shock and despair and challenge and, and also what we dream of. I, I feel like that's exactly what, where we, this time is, what's calling us is to be our most um, authentic reality and share that with each other. So I think what I did, um, leaned into, was at first creating ceremony and space for reflection, space for connecting with um, a more whole body, a more vast intelligence maybe. And, and I say that and it, it sounds, I hear myself saying that and, and implied in there some kind of um, something bigger or more important or expanded or better and I that that isn't what what I mean what what I mean is how where we are there's a there's, there's, a, there's a dehumanizing aspect to what we what we bring in terms of our whole intelligence that has that has contributed or actually for me has been is a root cause as to as to why we are in breakdown, why we are in multiple crisis and multiple collapse scenarios all over the world. And so my, my focus, my um, passion um, has been about creating space for new discovery, vision, vision articulation, the story of who we are and the story of a becoming that, that we are longing for. And my way to then 
well that that's been my way of of reckoning with the grueling and horrific reality for our children and the children of all species that the loss the grief the trauma mm. nevertheless with this outlook you have worked full time in a movement which is about seeking to uh, get societies to reduce carbon emissions draw down carbon so it's very much and for you that could you say why that's important and also where you can, um, find a way of working on the other aspect of your truth which is the kind of the the breakdowns that you anticipate or that you're seeing around you so you i think you said something about us being part of a movement that is has been asking or talking about solutions and drawing down carbon and um aspects of the truth and you see i don't i don't i don't, I don't see um that so much if i'm honest i don't I, I see extinction rebellion saying to people there's this most enormous of emergencies there's an existential threat to life on earth including our own and there are ways there are things that need to be done um urgently but we think that that's bet the solutions the the fix it nature of our paradigm is best left to a citizens assembly um to, left to making more democracy left to re reinventing a pillar of society around democracy um i don't think we sp we have spoken so much about what that looks like I think we're operating, I'm personally operating in, in, in much trust around people as a part of a movement of movements discovering what's, what's needed and what's necessary together. I also think it's that that takes us down a well-worn and threadbare track because I want much more from this and and i i believe we need much more than uh solutions that that draw down carb carbon sequestration or you know um technological solutions or um mitigation possibilities i, I think there's something here around what i call our our heart set um, instead of a mindset that needs to transform itself um it's like you know when when people are given a end of life diagnosis and or an, or have a near death experience and suddenly their whole sense of what what it is to be alive is different i i think that's what we're in i think we're we're moving from the exoteric and this is an initiation into the esoteric and and nothing for me nothing less is going to do and it's not in a policy or a poli or a, um a, a particular style of politicking or an economic restart it's in shifting something much deeper in the human psyche but is that is that then why you are very interested in what's called decolonization does that connect then absolutely i think the enlightenment project the the, the colonial project the project that that the patriarchy over five thousand years ago birthed into being um or what i call an obsessive patriarchy is 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 where the, the conversation really needs to go or, or the inquiry really needs to go and and 
Otherwise, I think we're tweaking and fixing around um, a systems and a culture that will take us to its death regardless. And has that been clear in Extinction Rebellion until now? The depth of the critique that we are in this predicament because of these thousand years of, of the dominant culture, the patriarchy. So I think we're really scared of talking about it. I know I have. I know in the face of our theory of change, our dominant theory of change, because actually we have an ecology of theories of change. I know in the face of, of the theory of change and the literature and research that we have um, extrapolated and shared with the world, that what I'm saying um, doesn't really speak to that and in some ways challenges that. And I, I know I, there hasn't been much space for looking beyond um, the, the, the strategy that we've employed in using Erica Chenoweth's work and Paul Engler's work and um, scientific research again. We're look, you know, we've been looking for a formula. We, Gail and Roger talk, to talk about codes for, for social change, yeah? It's, it's again, in that for me personally, it sits in the paradigm that we know to say that we think we, we, we know what social change is going to involve and it's, it's the, these set of numbers and these set of figures and this, this, this tactic and this strategy. And so it's, it's very difficult, but I'm ready. I'm ready not to be scared. I feel I'm, I'm um, personally in a place of self-annihilation <laughs> in, in, in terms of my old being. And I'm in a pretty fearless state right now. And, and I want to talk about this much more. So a lot of people, when they hear this, like environmentalism relates to decolonization and anti-oppression or patriarchy, it can sound like a lot of big words to some people. Could you say yeah. very clearly, how does anti-patriarchy, anti-racism uh, relate to the climate crisis and activism? So, so, so I think the issue, Gem, is that it's not, it's not anti, it's not, it's not being in an anti-science, even rebellion, okay, I understand it's what puts people off is that it's still a reactive space. You're, you're in your resistance and in your no to something which is really important, but it's only half of the story. And I think the reason, I think we are getting stuck again and again in the D bit, the, the unseating and the unlearning, the disentangling, the deconstruction that is decolonization or anti-racism or anti-oppression work. And what I'm really um, excited and um, inspired by is that we move into speaking about what we want and describing and articulating in, in words, in, in, in our body, in our expressions of, of how we, we show up as humans, what, what the, the dream and the possibility that is the yes, that is what I call the co-liberation work uh, right now within Extinction, but that's what, what we're calling it. It's, it's describing there is that place of unlearning, but it's describing what, what the new learning might look like. Where, we, where do we begin to step into um, our powerfulness and a freedom from our oppression, our, our traumatized um, ways of operating, behaving, speaking, creating strategy, creating, you know, our plans that we do. How do we step into something that um, speaks to the most free, most beautiful, most true place in us and describes that. So what, what will co-liberation look like as a project or activity or message within Extinction Rebellion and from Extinction Rebellion? So the idea of, of co-liberation is that the fundamental understanding um, or, or I'd say the essence of, of 
the, the, the co-liberation, the, the, the understanding that liberation can't be done individually and that individual solutions like me going on a decolonizing training or that individualizes the issue is, is so limited. The co-liberation understands that your safety depends on mine and mine on yours, as does my flourishing. That liberation is never only one way or one group. It can't be done like that. And, and what the project is, is trying to grow and co-create is, our, well, our systemic agreements, the systemic commitments and systemic inquiry into, into liberation. So, so we would, we would do this, we would do this, the, the thing that's made self, the self development, the self care, the self, you know, all this, um, the, the attribution that we, we give to the self in the project that is humanity is, is, is shifted into a state of co, a mutuality and a, 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 a coexistence an interconnectedness and, and one I can give you examples so one example that we're trying to uh, birth into within Extinction Rebellion is to say in every team we would have a co-liberation tracker that sits alongside the facilitator and it is tracking the power dynamics in that group where powerlessness and power meet in any group setting where, where our trauma and both our, well, our trauma, our oppression plays out in power over and in power under, right, behaviors. And, and how is it that when we, we know we all want to expand our power as a group and as individually, how, how do we sit within that together? How do we become true to that? I like the emphasis on liberation because environment in previous decades in the West hasn't really talked like that. So the first question is from Matt Osmond. Oh, hi, Matt. Oh, hi, Skina. Hi. And uh, firstly, thanks. And it's a delight to meet you here. And um, I, I think I first most powerfully connected with XR uh, when I met you at St. Ethelberger's um, some time ago, and it was an event there called Sacred Rebellion. But what you really introduced us to was Deep Adaptation. And, and that was a real eye-opener for me. I'd already read Deep Adaptation and it had affected me, but how close it was to the birth of the movement. Mm. And um, ever since then, I felt like there's been this question, um, and if it's okay, I want to ask it in my way and then tell you how I heard it from someone else in this forum that really helped me. Um, mm -hmm. The question for me that was really encapsulated in what you presented that day was this dilemma about a movement that maybe with a kind of momentum of its an unintended momentum keeps returning to an or else language. We've got 12 years left to save the world or else. And it's the same old or else language. And it's like it's ringing more and more brittle. And, and I, I wonder how many people I know who really think, who really do sincerely believe, and bless them if they do, that we're going to turn the taps off and stop climate change. You know, that that, that is going to happen in time. This feels such a personal question. Um, and I'm really nervous in answering it because um, I'm, I'm concerned for Jem's feelings in my response and, and other, other people's feelings. I think the issue is that we, we herald scientific truth as the number, the priority truth, as, this, as, a, as the truth that has a supremacy about it. And that's how I entered this, this field. So I, I, get, I get very confused about this because um, I, I was able to access this reality because I heard um, Jen present some science. But I think there, there is, the, is, is the challenge because 
if we do this because of of a scientism which i think is where we've we've got stuck in humanity if we do this because jem and others have said look at the climate science i i, I don't think we'll do much that could enable humanity to become the the most beautiful force it most regenerative presence in the community of life that it can be so it, I'm, I'm saying i kind of agree with you that um we, it can't be about saving and it can't be about mitigation or or and or else and because we're terrified and we're going to die and our children are going to die and it, it has to come from somewhere else and the, the but the place I, the, I have huge trust in human hearts and the morality and the, and the love that emanates from human heartedness so my my wish would be to lift other truths up to stand with the truth of the science and actually to give them more voice more space and a chance to reckon with with the, with the paradigm that is and and let's you know again i can bring this back to in the enlightenment project and the colonial project and you know everything that's emanated from there is, has been in this in the mirror image right um of what's, what's taken humanity off track what's taken us into control and fixed behaviors and and behaviors where we we think we know um what what science is we, we know because science is saying so but what about what we know from all the other ways that we know as human beings what about a much deeper knowing what about the truth that is the immorality that there's more food waste than than there are hungry people in this world what about the fact that we the so-called most civilized nation in the world the usa is where children are, can get shot in their school classrooms yeah what what about the fact that depression is about to become the number one illness in the world according to the world health organization by 2040 yeah the, these are truths and um but they're not located in a in a deft or definite science there, there's something that shows the dehumanizing the the despiritualizing of who we are in those truths and and that's i think what we need to talk about and i need to think i think we need to talk much less about climate science much less and and that's what i would be appealing to everybody for um yeah really clear thank you skeena louis you have a question on this too hi hi Skeena. i think you've basically kind of done a lot of answering my question which was to to link back to what you said about um obsessive patriarchy the enlightenment project for me, I um, so I'm just if I can see um, that capitalism, racism, colonialism. For me, I, I, my understanding is new that it's part of the same thing. I think my question is about how much is XR too narrow? I mean, I think you're saying XR needs to get much bigger. Oh, well, we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, I think like everything and, and you know Jem and Gail and Roger know this that you, there, there's, there's a credibility there's a way to access mass consciousness and sadly um, perhaps one of the, the most um, available ways is through science um, although I think I'm here to I'm ready to say that's actually why we haven't cut through because you're still accessing you're still you're still using the mind to make meaning um and it's not working you know it, 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 i don't see i don't see um a, the kind of waking up that we talk about the you know and the four hours of relinquishment and restoration and all those things um that we know are part of of 
the challenge. I don't, I don't see um, people really able to hear them. And, and so because I think we're, we're talking to the frontal lobes, we're talking to people's frontal lobes, and that's huge, hugely limited, right? And, and we know all this. I know, Gem, you know all this. Um, so so it, for us, it's the question is, what, what you're saying is, how do we make meaning that, that matters to people's hearts, where, where they, can, they can find a relatedness to to the reality that we we are living in in through the deep adaptation forum graham hello uh skeena i recently read a paper from a right-wing think tank in america um, and let me assure everybody that is not my usual reading material but sometimes it's interesting to see what other people with different views are thinking and this was postulating that the right-wing parties, particularly the Republicans post-Trump, could co-opt the climate agenda, could suddenly wake up, recognise that there's very little time left to do anything, and be very aggressively, um, uh, very aggressively pursue that, that climate agenda, not bothering to be awake, not bothering about ideas like truth or justice or anything like that, and um, maybe that would get things to happen quickly. Uh, we already know that the Chinese government and, and other um, dictatorial governments can make things happen quickly. Um, question for you is, would you welcome such a move if it got action? Or do we have to wait until everybody's awake? Uh, all these problems you've spoken about that have been there since forever uh, and not got solved, we have to wait till all those are solved uh, and then the changes introduced by the right people, the correct people, I should say, rather than the right people, using right in two senses. Um, I just want to make sure I understand your question. Are, are you asking me if, if who, it doesn't matter who makes the change? No, I'm asking you if people make the change for the wrong reasons from, and from a perspective that you and I might not agree with. Uh, should we welcome that because it makes it happen and makes it happen more quickly even if a lot of rights and justice and truths are trampled in the process because we have so little time or do we have to wait until the right pe the correct people the people we agree with maybe are in power and they can bring about change okay so i think i'm hearing a binary here right people wrong people um and i i, I don't I don't really <laughs> know how to be with, with binaries right now. Um, and so I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I don't feel like I can answer this question eloquently, but I'm, I'm going to, I have a tiny go at saying, um, it, it just, it, for, for me, it, it's about us having communication with all people and it's about uh, how we, would reach out to all political ideologies, all communities. How would we, how do we build deep collaboration? And this has been like uh, at the heart of the visioning team's um, quest to build what we've termed deep collaboration as the, vi as the vision for sy systems change and transformation of, you know, of all the different kinds that we're seeking. And what we realized, what I realized after a year and a half of um, cycling constantly around this vision and this dreaming about collaboration is that it's, it feels pretty much impossible when we are so separated in right and wrong, left and right, and, and you know, good and bad, it, that, that the, the divisions that, that exist right now, the separation story that that is, um, that's what we need to, 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 to bring our attention to and our compassion and um, also our, our truth and our, our fierce demand for, for, for that separation story to come to its end, to come to its rightful end. And so, yeah, 
I, I, I think we need to go much deeper than who do we work with and, and how do we work with them. It's, for me, it's how do we liberate ourselves enough for it to cascade and, and heal and reconcile, repair the relationships between the tribes that are humanity in whichever way we've separated into, into tribes. Let's hear a question from Julian in Stroud. Hi, Julian. So nice to see you. Hi, Skeena. Great to see you too. Thank you for all of this. Really great stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you hit it in one with your point about we, we need to uh, change our heart set. Um, that clearly is where this has to come from. And, you know, I've been banging on uh, about climate and sustainable development for much of my life. I'm an environmental engineer. And I suppose uh, my big turning point was when the water industry was privatized. Um, I, I went into environmental engineering as a, a, an in-service pro profession. Well, not a hope in hell. Uh, I, I, basically, it's, it's almost impossible to work honestly in that sector. Um, and I would say, you know, I'm, I'm rapidly concertinering this point uh, because it's, it's a huge and complex issue. But yeah, I mean, the damage that Margaret Thatcher did to our society through saying greed is good uh, is profound and, and, and huge. Um, the question to come to it uh, is really exposing the complete antithesis of that point. And you were good enough to come out a, a few months before lockdown to come and look at the concrete fields around Stroud. Mm -hmm. and really mad and concrete. We've lost all the humus in our fields. And as a water engineer, I assure you, we can account for the vast bulk of all the climate change effects simply through farming practice in the Stroud area in summer months, and that ranges from temp temperature through to intensification of rainfall through to flood runoff. But my point is regarding the opposite What's of that. Question, What's your question? Simply this, that there are many good climate exemplars within the sacred, regenerative, and true uh, vegan farming movements, where they all universally sequestrate carbon as soil humus, the complete opposite of what you saw around Stroud. Um, and these all broadly work within these principles that the UN are increasingly pushing, the tree eater Karana principles that come out of Bali, where historically Bali has a sacred agricultural system that again sequestrates carbon. Talking about carts and horses, um, basically the ethos has to come first. That's where we need to start. And so you're totally correct. It's, it's as much a statement as a question. Um, we need to apply the ethos before we can change this, this world with all its horrors back into a beautiful, um, safe world for us all to live in. I'll take that as a statement. What do you say to people that, says, that say, this sounds too much like middle-class people getting too self-involved when there's horrendous suffering right now because of the climate and ecological disaster and that this is turning inward when actually we should be mobilizing um, to try and do something about international suffering. What would I say to those people? Um, I'd firstly say, tell me more about that suffering um, because I don't think I've heard enough I don't think I could possibly hear enough. I don't think we've heard enough. I think that they're, they're, you know, actually um, part of our psychosis and our narcissism. And, and I, I, I agree there's so much navel gazing and turning inward um, is part of that. The, the, the thing that, um, one of the things I think that has happened in terms of the consumption culture is the ability of, for, of, of the middle classes to switch off from the pain of others and, and, and come into a therapizing about it and be endlessly lost in the, in the self therapizing. Um, and, and 
I, I feel I actually get very frustrated and especially because that's been my work for 20 years when people are are in, in in process with their body mind heart and they are just circling they are constantly circling re-traumatizing and circling and and actually avoiding the pain and the suffering that you've just pointed to Jen, not not to feel it you know i i i wouldn't i want to say to the middle classes feel feel that pain walk into that fire walk into that fire that 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 is showing itself to you and and become debilitated in it become horrified and despairing and aghast and you know become helpless in it in the face of that pain become helpless and until you do until you are able to sit in the fire of it there is no there is just this there's just what we're in you know where people who have the privilege to avoid the suffering constantly avoid the suffering and 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 speak about it and circle with their peers around it so i would say sorry to those people if you know that you you're speaking about i am so sorry and i'm so my heart aches every day and sometimes i can't get out of bed because my heart is so sore my chest is so heavy and then sometimes i can and i i can i can activate something thank you question from wendy hi Skina. Hi, wendy. Um, in relation to what you were just saying actually about the people talking about the suffering and um, reading the news and knowing that it's a thing as um, someone who does a lot of work on the the facebook group do you think there is a way of triggering people to have this realization that you had from james conversation with you that i had from seeing the icebergs melting and realizing that they, were, they weren't coming back in our lifetimes or our grandchildren or great grandchildren do you or the x one movement have a feeling for what it is and i mean there's many things that i think it's quite personal but do you know of a way to actually push a button with someone have you have you used that on friends or people who you can't get through to there's that blockage so thank you that's, that's just such an important question so i think um there's lots i don't know i think about this about how to press the button um that resets something essentially in in a human being and i think what happened for me is that i've got witnessed i got witnessed by rupert reed who was there firstly he literally held me um i also got witnessed by jem <laughs> who was called out um to speak to me and then i got witnessed as soon as i returned home um by close friends that i trusted who could tell me i'm not going mad um i'm not shaking for no reason I'm having an appropriate response. Um, it, the dysregulation that occurs from receiving shocking news needs human holding. It needs a belonging somewhere. People are quite right to avoid it. It's too overwhelming if that is not present in your life. I think human beings, ultimately, we are here to survive, right? We are here to to make um to allow for thriving and in it in our um genius if we are told shocking information um information that threatens the lives of of the ones we love if we don't have witnessing and holding and a community that can be with you in any questions that then need exploring and answering and activating then you know the best thing you can do is shut down of course it is so i think what i know is that somehow we have to build many more communities that are have the capacity to witness and hold this story and that's what i'm interested in xr doing and becoming to spark and grow communities that can hold trauma and and 
the the landscape of emotions that um, will surface when we when we are presented with with threat. Does that mean below the radar, or do you engage mass media? Um, because for me, I chose not to engage mass media because of what you've just talked about. So for me, there's no deliberate policy about engaging anyone, Jem, especially not mass media, as a deliberate policy. You know, um, the, the, but the, the, the thing, the, the beautiful thing here is that there are human beings involved in mass media. Um, and there are lots of people that we will naturally touch, who will touch others, and we can trust. I, I think I, I, I would like us to trust that we can reach mass media because we are in relationship with human beings that I don't that, mean that Skeena is that is this sorry. message is this message to go out through mass media to people who are unsupported I didn't okay. I didn't want okay. to do that so if I remember after my speech with XR Channel 4 News came up and I said no my message is worse than XR's and I don't want that to just land in people's living rooms unsupported. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I've, 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 I've focused I've, more on that, those networks of people and yeah. helping create the capacities for people to hold each other for when more people wake up to this. And that's yeah. been my aim for the last two years rather than the, the, the big advocacy piece because of what you just talked about, yeah, how do you I'm hold really each other? Great. You're really grateful for all of that work that you have committed to in holding the, the, this, the subtleties here. Um, I, I completely agree and I stopped talking to the media too. Um, but I, I don't think there's an absolutism here either. I think we can, we can talk about this in a way that says, look, we think the most important thing people can do right now is to build community resilience in in, in psychologically and um, physically and, and materially and all, all of the ways that community builds resilience. So I think we can have this conversation in a different way. Um, and, and like I say, I'm, I'm no longer with the idea that we, we, pres we lead with the science. Okay, I'm looking forward to what this means for XR in the future. Um, both what you've just described and what you've talked about with co-liberation. We've come to the end of the hour. Thank you, Skeena, and thank you, everyone, and thank you, Matthew, everyone, for the Everyone, thank you to Jem. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you, Skeena. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. See you next month.